Wind and Tide. As some of you will have noted, each Family 360 episode has a running time of around 30 to 35 minutes. Starting now in Season 2, we're going to try a bit longer of a format. More towards 45 to 55 minutes. Yeah, because we're finding our guests have so much wonderful information to share. Oh, and as do. a result, we are making them all into two-part episodes. So we're going to try this longer format mm-hmm. so that listeners don't have to wait two weeks to hear the rest yeah. of the conversation. Which means more guests. And more episodes and more insights. And more work for us, but that's okay. <laughs> but because we love it. We do love it. Also, each episode contains short 20-second music breaks. So if you find this extended version too long for one sitting, you can pause on one of those mm-hmm. and jump back in when the time is yeah, right. Yeah, sorbets. That's what one of our guests called those musical breaks. <laughs> it's a great term. Yeah. A musical break between courses. Yeah. So please let us know what you think. We always love hearing from our listeners. We really, really do. <laughs> And Rachel actually claps her hands every time we get a message. She's so happy about it. I do. do. So please connect with us. And now let's jump into today's episode. Hello and welcome to Family 360. A podcast of conversations exploring life together. Parenting and all the ways we are family to each other. I'm Rachel Cram, educator and founding director of Wind and Tide Education Community. I'm Roy Salmon, audio producer and founder of Whitewater Studios. And together, we're the hosts of Family 360, interviewing specialists, artists, and storytellers. And now for this week's episode. Janet Lansbury is a trusted expert in parenting and childcare throughout North America. Her books, blogs, and podcasts are a resource for millions of parents. And we follow her on social media. And her knowledge and delivery is so accessible and Mm -hmm. encouraging. She's a very caring and wise parenting specialist. As we discovered even further when we met with her for this interview. Yes, she's so committed in her care for children and families. Rooted in the teachings of early childhood educator and author Magda Gerber, Janet's work empowers parents to calmly address the behaviors of their children while at the same time honoring their child's emotions and experiences in a manner that helps their developing brain thrive. Janet's podcast, Unruffled, and her books, No Bad Kids and Elevating Child Care. Which we highly recommend to parents of young children. We've been doing that, absolutely. They offer practical and specific advice for common parenting situations and support for the dilemmas of raising infants, toddlers, and preschools. Her practical wisdom applies to how we raise our children, Mm. our teenagers, and even ourselves. It applies to all relationships as we seek to respectfully connect and care for one another. Yeah. Janet, it's such a pleasure to talk with you. In preparation for this interview, as well as for my own learning, I've been listening to your Respectful Parenting podcast, and you often read letters from your listeners and then respond. And you are so articulate and wise and well-researched, so it's exciting to talk with you today. Thank you so much for wanting to speak with me. It's a pleasure to meet you. I love the work that you and Roy are doing, and it resonates with me, and I'm very, very happy to be here. Oh, that's so great. Well, you know, as I listen to you, I'm usually running in the morning and I've got this little game going with you that when you read the question from your listener, I think to myself, what's she going to say? How is she going to answer this? And you you do so well explaining your answers. So I highly recommend your podcast. Thank you. I Some people have told me that they try to figure out what the what answer's you're gonna, gonna be like kind of <laughs> yeah. like sleuthing, like a, a mystery. What could really help this person? And I realized from people giving me that feedback, that's actually something I love sleuthing <laughs> and kind of figuring out the story and what's going on and what the child's thinking and unwrapping all of that. And I actually love that process. Oh, yeah, sleuthing. As you say that, you've also been an actor and you played a sleuth. <laughs> what did you play? Uh, Nancy Drew. I really didn't mean to bring that up. <laughs> well, you know what? Just as I was starting to talk to you, I was thinking, you have an acting background. So, yeah, it all comes together. All these things come together, right? <laughs> and yes. you landed, and but you landed in early childhood. How did you move from acting to early childhood? Because it kind of fits together. I guess it does. Acting, I sort of fell into, but it it never felt like this is my life's work. It was not something that particularly fed me in any way. I'd always look forward to having children. And then I had my daughter and she was wonderful, beautiful baby. And I was completely overwhelmed. I felt like I didn't really have a plan. And it was very, very disappointing to me because I thought that 
this was going to be when I flourished in life. <laughs> You're waiting for the natural to land. Exactly. Life coming naturally. Yeah. Exactly. And there was a lot of that belief that you should know how to do this, go with your instincts. And people would look at you strangely if you said, I don't really know what I'm supposed to do and I need a plan. Well, just mm -hmm. take care of her and love her and follow your instincts. And that, for me, that wasn't enough. And mm -hmm. then I happened to find out about Magda Gerber's work and ended up taking a class. And that turned everything around for me. I fell in love with the philosophy. I wanted to learn everything I could possibly learn about it. And so I did with Magda Gerber herself. And that was an amazing experience. She's an incredible mentor. And my instincts were telling me, oh my gosh, this is so right. Letting children have their feelings. They're not these blank slates that we have to fill up. Tuning in to who they are and wanting to support their journey and callings and their passions and their interests. All this gets proven to you when you're observing your child in this approach. Well, I think... I think that mentorship, whether it comes from our own parents or a teacher like you found in Magda, is such, is such a gift. Yeah. Maybe we think that because we've been kids ourselves, surely raising our own will not be complicated, but then it so is. Exactly. Right? I think it is like, especially if you're uh, what I was at that time, which was somewhat, I guess, perfectionist, didn't want to do anything wrong, but I think there is this feeling that we're just supposed to know. And Magda used to say, well, any other job that you're doing, you would prepare for, you would train for. And here's this job that most of us consider really, really important, maybe the most important job that we have. And we are expected to just know what to do. Well, in your writing and on your podcast, you write and speak with uh, compassion and sensitivity for parents I think in recognizing that we do need help, we do need clear explanations, and you provide very articulate wisdom. Thank you. As parents, consciously or unconsciously, we parent as we've been parented ourselves. It's what we know. We also know that childhood is such a formative period of life, and psychology holds childhood as a time when we develop values and attitudes and beliefs that will last our lifetime. Right. So, Janet, I'm wondering, is there a story or experience from your childhood that you recognize as formative in who you are today? Wow. Well, <laughs> This is kind of crazy. But interestingly, and I think a lot of people maybe have gone through their interesting journeys during this pandemic time, I have just come to some new realizations this last summer about my childhood um, mm. through a few different ways. One is this woman that does body work with me sometimes. For years, I've been going to her and she tapped into some things for the first time that brought up some emotional memories and whew, it's so hard because the, these early years, right? This is such a formative time, as you said, and yet this is the time we don't remember. And what, what do you mean by body work? This is very interesting. Well, this is when someone working on you is touching off emotions that are actually stored in our body. And now there's a lot of science behind the holistic elements of emotions and how our bodies and our minds and our souls are all um, connected. Yeah. So body work helps release that. Yeah. So the body work helps release that. It is such a new kind of science. Anyways, I don't want to interrupt you. Keep going. No, no, no. Discover? I'm glad that you know that as well. That <laughs> yeah. I mean, this was all surprising to me. Um, so what did you discover? Can you, can you say? Well, it was kind of things I knew, but never really put together. Mm. What I found out was that my mother, who I love dearly, she was a wonderful person, a giver. But there were things that happened to me with her that were, I just took it on myself as children do, as, you know, I'm shameful, I'm bad, I'm going to be rejected if I make waves or show certain emotions. And Every child has different sensitivities to certain right. things, and this we know, right? So for me, I was very sensitive to some things that happened. Mm -hmm. So 
I knew all of that, but I hadn't really put all the pieces together hmm. for me. So how did you interpret that? I just thought that I have all these bad parts of me. I have shameful things about me. But now that I have children that are all three adults, I can see it was mm. extreme in a lot of ways. And so it's interesting. Like, I'm still learning more all the time. Yeah. We never stop learning. Well, I think parenting has shifted so much from the generation of our parents. We are now learning through science and understanding of neuroplasticity, the significance of unconditional love and connection and the attachment that flows from that kind of care. Yes. And I think people that listen to your podcast, people that listen to, to ours, they tune in because they don't want to be in a situation like your mom was in, right? Right. And that's that's a fear of us as parents, that one day our child will be sitting in front of a mic saying, things my mom did screw me up. <laughs> and, there's a, and there's a reality to that, isn't there? A tension with that that we live with. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, th I feel mm -hmm. like the people that are listening to your podcast, listening to my podcast, reading articles, reading books, these seekers that so many parents are right now, mm -hmm. I see it as a beautiful thing. Then I feel like the fact that parents are seeking means that they're not going to do those things. Yeah. Because even if they do behave out of their own childhood, as many of us do, they will notice it. There were things that happened with one of my daughters when she was very young, and then I had another baby, my youngest. And I feel like it took me years to connect with that and to say to her, I wish I would have had more emotional energy for your transition at this time. I wish mm -hmm. I would have done differently. And like, we can mm -hmm. always go back even mm -hmm. years later and be open about these things and realize them and then share them with our child we could still repair with our adult children. So I know what you mean about being afraid, but it's not as delicate. Yeah. And I think one of our previous guests has said that parenting is not a snapshot. It's a movie. You have the time to go back and revisit moments with your kids or revisit moments with your parents and heal. It doesn't all have to be perfect in the moment as much as we'd want it to be. Yes, absolutely. You speak really eloquently on setting boundaries with our kids. And you have a language that encompasses everything you've just been talking about, letting our children be separate from ourselves, letting them grow as nature intends them to grow and to flourish. But at the same time, knowing the importance of having those boundaries, being large and in charge so that they can feel safe. I, I just wanna read something from your wonderful book, No Bad Kids, Toddler Discipline Without Shame. So good. Thank you. I highly recommend it. And you say toddler discipline without shame, but as I've read it, my kids right now range in ages from 10 years old to 28 years old. And I I feel like it's not just for toddlers. Mm -hmm. It's for children. It's for teens. It's for us as adults as well. Right. Do you, does that come to you as you talk about this? Yes. And that yeah. is because children are people. They're born whole people. So our job isn't molding a person, it's developing a relationship. Mm -hmm. And the ideas I share in No Bad Kids and everywhere else are all about a relationship, the way you wanna treat another person. And that's why it translates into definitely yeah. all ages of children, but even with us as adults, it's mm -hmm. a respectful yeah. way of understanding where the person's coming from and giving them what they need that will help them so it's relationship based. Hmm. So I'm going to read. You say toddlers are experienced at ruffling our feathers, but these tiny people mean no disrespect. Testing our limits and patience is impulsive behavior on their part and a developmentally appropriate way to seek answers to important questions like, am I safe and cared for? Do I have confident leaders? 
are they with me or against me? Is it okay to want what I want to feel what I feel? And I think this rationale for pushing boundaries is probably true for most of us, not just for toddlers. Yeah. We push boundaries for those kind of reasons. Can you describe what it might look like when a child is testing our limits? Yes. Yeah, so testing, to make it simple, it is asking a question. You know, if something is repetitively being tested, they still haven't gotten the answer they need mm -hmm. on this. Mm. So it can be with an infant creeping on the floor. I'm going over to this dog food and I'm touching this. So the first time they did that, it was pure exploration. But then they noticed that the parent reacted nervously or scolded them or, or did something that now they're seeing that my leader is a little undone by this. This has got so much power with this person. And so now I have to test it again to see, is this person together? Is this a big deal? Or am I rocking their world through this simple thing that I'm doing, that I'm exploring? And so then it becomes a test. And that's when ideally the answer we want to give is clear Oops. Yeah, that's the dog's food. I can't let you do that. And then we ideally will have a way to get it out of their environment. Or maybe we're, we're just sitting there and we've got our hand there, but we're very calmly not giving this power. We're very calmly saying, yeah, that is interesting, isn't it? We're seeing their point of view, but uh, yeah, those aren't safe for you. Or those are the dogs or can't let you put those in your mouth. Mm. So Children are just needing an answer. They're mm -hmm. not trying to wind us up. They just haven't gotten the clarity that they need on this. And, and sometimes it's because we reacted emotionally. When children are actually doing their job, which is to learn and explore, this is what children do more brilliantly than anyone else of any other age, is they are amazing learners. Um, and this is a very interesting thing for them to learn about. What do the leaders do? What gets them upset? What has power that I'm doing? So they're just wanting answers. Maybe a toddler is going to pick up our cell phone, which I'm sure they've already learned is something we don't want them to touch. So they're not being bratty or mean to us here. They're just saying, okay, like you haven't been clear with me on this. You get really mad at me and you tell me no, and you shout at me, but that's strange because I really need you to just have a calm reaction and understand, of course, I'm going to touch this. Of course, I'm going to explore these things that are adult things that are so interesting to me or, or anything in my environment. I'm just doing my job. How do the leaders react to this? Is this a big deal to them? Mm -hmm. Are they going to get mad at me? So these are questions that children are asking. The word test in a way, it sounds so intentional on the part of the child mm -hmm. and it can feel intentional too, but this is all unconscious for kids coming from insecurities or inquiry into their surroundings or into our relationship. What's going through the child's head with regard to the parents? So one way to generalize it is to understand that there is some level of discomfort that is causing the child to push a limit. It can be as minor as my parents, they they have different responses to this. They really they haven't been clear on this. And I'm not sure what is the rule here? Like, am I allowed to do this or not? They're kind of giving me a mixed message. So these are, again, not things children are, are consciously, you know, working through in their brains, but it's this impulse that they have to get comfort from us really to get that leadership that they need so that they can not have to worry about it and do all the things that 
children need to do, play and learn. And mm. so they, they have to learn about us first. They have to learn about who's in charge. You know, I guess we could say that about us as adults, too. You know, if we're in a situation where the people in charge are not being clear and we don't know what's going on, it's really hard to focus on our work. So in a way, it's similar with children. So it can be that level of discomfort. And they want the answer to be easy for us. They don't want it to feel like they're so powerful that they're rocking these adults that are just huge, giant figures to them, that they're rocking our world, that they're making us mad, that they're making us nervous by their two-year-old behavior. <laughs> because then it's like, whoa, yikes. I, <laughs> I have as much power as these people, and I don't know what I'm doing. I need them to help. Again, this is all like unconscious feelings that cause children to to push limits. So there's that level. And then it can get bigger in the discomfort to the level of, I'm just exhausted and people get so angry at me and it's really scary and I can't help myself. I just mm. keep getting stuck in this and my stress level is constantly getting aroused and now I'm just like flailing, you know? So there's that intense discomfort and then everything in between that causes the child to test. But um, And some kids seem to test limits more than other kids do. Yeah. What, what, what makes that happen? Like, what would be the difference with a child? Does it come down to will or? Yes, it can be a stronger will or it's, it's actually a stronger need often for mm -hmm. the parent to stay on their side. It's actually, uh, I know that I have all this power as a person because I'm this you know, strong-willed child, which of course that makes into a great adult if we can help them channel it into positive things and not just be testing all their lives. So there's that kind of person and they know that they need a really capable leader. And a really capable leader is the opposite of the one that yells the loudest or is the most stern or harsh. A really capable leader is the one that's Mm. Oh, yes, of course you want that, my dear. No, the answer's no. <laughs> I, I'm not intimidated by you. I'm not upset by you. I can be stronger than you. I mean, that's why my, my podcast is called Unruffled. Stronger mm. looks more comfortable, not louder and bigger and more intense. That's not what stronger mm. is in a leader, and the kind that a child needs. So oftentimes those stronger willed children know that they need the strongest leader of all. And unconsciously, mm. I believe that's what they're testing for. That's what they're trying to get so desperately mm. in this behavior that looks maybe really bad to us. It's a deep need that they're expressing. And I had an oldest child like this, and that was part of my journey. Children are constantly, unconsciously working on us to make us into the best people we can be for them. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the gifts of being a parent, that we get to find the best version of ourselves, the strongest, the most mm -hmm. confident. And we all have this leader inside of us. I know I did not think I had this at all. I'm a people pleaser. I want everyone to like me. I don't want to make people mad. This is all from my childhood. They're not going to love me anymore if I mm. lay down the law or say no to something they want to do. Mm. All of that fear inside of me. And, and what I had to realize is that doing what I was doing was mm. not loving. So I had to totally understand and reframe this as limits are helping children to feel more comfortable and therefore be able to let go of testing and flourish in the comfort and safety of our limits. So it's not a mean thing, it's not a bad thing, even though children will react as if it is and they won't tell you, thank you for giving me the limit. Yeah. They won't tell us this, so we have to know this. We have to see it proven to us. Even when they cry, we realize I've given them the gift of honesty and directness and clarity, and that's what love is. So I had to totally reframe love for myself. 
to be able to do this. And I believe every parent can, probably more easily than I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, reframing love, as you're saying, is tricky for all of us. <laughs> but you said that studies are showing that parents are having more trouble, especially in more recent generations, setting boundaries with their children. Why do you think that is? I think it's for a very positive reason. I think it's because parents are rejecting some of the more authoritarian ways that they were raised. But to embrace this, what I call the respectful way, is difficult because we don't have a lot of models of this. We don't have models of it in the media. We haven't seen it, what it looks like, feels like, so that people can visualize. But it's difficult. So what people tend to do is, I know I don't want to do that way, but I don't really know what this other way is. So now I'm kind of frozen. I don't know what to do. So that's why so much of my work has been focused on this topic, to give a lot of examples of different scenarios, what it feels like, what it looks like, and how it's very consistent. You are always treating your child like a person. You are always respecting them. You are always trying to encourage their feelings, whatever kind of feelings they are, and not try to squelch it or avoid it or even try to make it better, not try to change it, but really trust that, oh, okay, this needs to be expressed so my child doesn't have to behave that way anymore. So it's actually very simple, but it's not easy. It's not easy because it's different. Yeah, it's hard to parent in a way that we perhaps haven't been parented ourselves. Exactly. I'm Rachel Cram. Thank you for joining us on Family 360 for our conversation with author, podcaster, and parenting specialist, Janet Lansbury. Our next release is with psychologist and developmental theorist, Dr. Gordon Newfeld. This is our second interview with Dr. Newfeld, and we invite you into our lively discussion on the essential nature of true play. And now back into our conversation with American educator, Janet Lansbury, as she describes the tension that builds when we're not clear on our boundaries. Um, Janet, you have said without boundaries, children have too much responsibility, that life becomes scary for them. How do you see that playing out in a child, that scariness, that tension starting to build? You can see that in that they get stuck in a controlling pattern where they're getting more controlling of the parent. What would that look like? Um, it can look different ways, but it can be... Uh, I won't let you leave my side, or I need this certain mm -hmm. color cup when I'm drinking. Sometimes you'll hear children actually say to parents, you need to do this, or you need to do that. It can be expressed that way very strongly. And where it just may seem, oh, they're bossy, or they're this or that, it's actually a very uncomfortable place for a child to be because they really are stuck there. They need someone else to take the mantle so that they don't mm -hmm. have to try to control the adults so that they can be free and be the kids. And yet when we step in to take that leadership, uh, they're not always happy because happiness, as you say, does not mean getting what you want all of the time. Yeah. So when you do start to take charge in that loving way, then the letting go of that tension of controlling everybody can look like this big gnarly release of emotions. And so it's not that we've made the child unhappy. It's that the child is kind of, huh, now I can scream out all this fear that I've had and all this uh, anger that I've had to be doing this job that you're supposed to be doing. It's a positive thing. And actually all feelings that children express are a positive thing. Mm. Yeah, they are unhappy in that moment, but true happiness comes when children feel that people are safely leading them and guiding them, taking care of them. And in those moments, if you're a parent who's sensitive or maybe isn't super confident in your role yet, you can take your child's limit pushing personally. Yes. You can feel yeah. that it's about you. I understand that. And that's tough. It is tough. It is tough. And that's why really understanding our children's point of view is going to help us so much. They're showing you they need help. That's really all it is. We're not seeing how young our child is and how difficult it is for them to self-regulate mm. emotions. And 
When we're taking that offense, we're not seeing those things. Right. We're not seeing how much power we have. And maybe we're projecting our own issues we've had with parents into our child. But children can't be in that role. They can't have that responsibility to be nice to us just because they love us. Mm. They love us. We could do unkind things and they still love and adore us in these early years. We have all the power, really. Mm. Well, talking about power, you talk about how you, in your mind, think about putting on your superhero suit when these moments come up. Do you want to describe that analogy? I, th I think that's a really good one. Thank you. Yeah, so I think it helps to find some imagery that shows us that, you know, we are the ones in power. Our child needs help. It's always about help. And so if we see that, then we can be the heroes rescuing them. Mm. Even in these little situations where they're stuck telling us, I need this cup and I need that cup, we're rescuing them from being stuck in that control state. Or we're rescuing them because they're hitting other children and we got to get them out of the situation. Usually later we realize, oh gosh, they're exhausted or this was the wrong time of day to do this or we stayed too long. But literally like carrying them out, oh, yeah. sometimes they're kicking and screaming and we're rescuing them. Well, you're doing what needs to be done, whether they appreciate it in the moment or not. Yeah. You've given them exactly what they need and done something that's felt really hard to you. And so sometimes I think of it as like, you're in a burning building and you have to help that child to jump up out of the, the window into the net. And they're saying, no, 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 I don't want to do this. And what do you do? You're not going to say like, oh, OK, well, let's try it this way, that way. You're going to say, I know you don't want to do this. You can scream at me all the way out, but I got to do this. So that mm -hmm. can be taken into almost any boundary situation, that sense of our role. In your book, you say this, when an infant approaches the end of his first year, parents begin to struggle with boundaries. The sooner a caregiver or a parent can establish those limits, the easier it will be for the child to relinquish testing and returning to play. And as you're talking about that superhero and, and helping the child jumping out of the building, that's really what we're wanting. We, we're wanting our child to jump fully into play and being a kid, feeling secure and knowing that we've got them. And you have these four guideposts for setting boundaries with our kids that I've categorized in my mind as all beginning with a C. And I'm just wondering <laughs> if I can get you to build on them because I think they give a framework for how we move in that superhero mode. All right. Okay, so my first C word from your work is connecting points and the importance of using connecting points during the day to really engage with our child and really protecting those times. Do you know what I'm talking about there? Yes, absolutely. So parents will sometimes feel like they don't know how much attention they're supposed to give their children and caregiving times are the most important time to connect because this is a time where we're usually doing intimate things with our child and it starts with infants. We're changing their diaper, we're dressing them, we're bathing them, we're feeding them. And that translates into meal times as children get older. And these times are the most sacred to be fully present, even if you're not talking with your child, just to be there, to be available, not have your phone, not be interrupted. If you do that and prioritize these times for connection, then your child isn't always trying to get your attention because they've had full attention. Yeah, they're not vying for it all the time, right? Yeah. So other people will talk about special time and that can be wonderful too, but these are the most important times because mm -hmm. this is when we're actually teaching, guiding, children are learning about self-care, they're learning language, they're learning to be participatory, even with an infant, which means we're going to talk them through it and pause so that they can respond and be part of the experience. And that's important. So they're learning all these incredible things and they're filling up with our attention. If we just do those, then we've done enough. If we want to also be there mm -hmm. watching them play, we're going to learn a lot about our child or playing with them. That is great too, but that's sort of icing on the cake. If we can use these naturally intimate times to be fully present. 
Mm. Well, I'm thinking with older kids, moments where you're driving them in the car to a sporting activity or picking them up from school or bedtime routines. I think what I'm hearing you say is there's these moments when you are going to have to be with your child. So fully use them. Exactly. Into all the potential that is there. And don't be half there because you this you have to be there. So be there. Exactly. And these moments are gold. And there's actually some research behind this that Sherry Turkle did. I don't know if you're aware of her work, but mm-hmm. she interviewed 300 teenagers and asked them about their parents' cell phone use. And the teenagers were actually quite bothered, but they mm-hmm. didn't feel comfortable expressing this to their parents, which is for one thing interesting. So sad. I know. Yeah. And they said that the times that bothered them most, this goes along with the caregiving times, was meal time, mm. so at dinner or whatever, and then transitions when they were, like you said, getting picked up from school or getting dropped off. Those times their parent would be texting and they're coming in the car and they just want a few moments here mm-hmm. and there. These aren't mm-hmm. long periods of time. And then the other one was when they're actually performing, watching them play, they're doing sports, they're doing something that's stretching them. They would want their parents full attention at that time. So I thought that was so interesting because it definitely aligned with everything we know. And just this idea that their parent could be interrupted at any moment, Mm -hmm. any moment something was going to take precedence over being with them. This isn't to guilt anybody, but just to be aware that this can be a priority that will actually help your child's behavior, help them to play independently away from you, yeah. help everything. Yeah, well, when you're talking about guilting people, I think that we can become overwhelmed to think, do I have to be fully engaged 100% of the time? Of course, that's not possible. Right. But it's saying, here's times when you are going to be yeah. engaged. So be engaged. And then the other times, give yourself a break to know that you will only be there 50% or 20 because other things are going on. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so connecting points. Then you talk about conviction. You say parents need to decide on a plan so that there is clarity for their kids. How do we get that conviction, even with our partner? How do we show up with conviction? Well, it stems from, again, understanding what love is for a child and even for a partner. Love is me Mm. telling you the truth about, you know, this is what I'm going to do now. You can disagree, but... I'm doing this or I'm saying no to this. That is much more loving than, okay, um, all right, I'll play with you. I don't want to, but I will. And you come at it half-hearted. Yeah. Yeah. And how does a child feel about that? Or like, okay, you can have another popsicle. Now I'm pissed off at you and I'm going to be really grumpy later. And now some little thing that you do later is going to set me off because I'm grumpy. I mean, I'm saying this from my own (laughs) feelings, so this isn't (laughs) to put it on anyone else. But it's not as loving as Mm -hmm. being direct, making a decision that we can change our mind later, but with conviction, because children really need that. Again, that's the leadership model that they want. If we're wishy-washy, They've got to keep trying. Well, if I say this one more thing, if I ask her one more time. And again, that's them getting stuck in that controlling pattern Yeah, that we don't Well, and you're saying if you're going to change your mind, change your mind with conviction, because there are the times when you've said, no, I've said no, and that's the way it's going to be. And then they say, yeah, but you promised yesterday. And you're like, oh, shoot, I did promise that yesterday. So there is the opportunity, I guess, and you're saying to change your mind yeah. with conviction, which I like. Yeah, that, that's good. Or you can even yeah. say, let me think about this. You know, it's this inner core of assurance that hmm. gives our child what they need. You know, it really, really does. And so we can change our mind with conviction. It's not like set in stone. Oh, gosh, I, you know, I have to decide forever. But the the part of the conviction that makes it so respectful, besides that we understand that this is what our children are really asking for, is that I'm so convicted that 
you can be as angry with me as you want, or you can scream at me, you can whine about it 50 times, and I'm still here making this decision. I'm not repeating myself and trying to convince you. I'm allowing you to have your right to feel however you feel about it. So that's the part that's mm -hmm. maybe different from how a lot of us were raised as well, where it was like, my way or the mm -hmm. highway, and now you better be happy about it too. You know, Don't cry about it. But that's the part that's mm -hmm. respectful. And that's where I would put on my hero suit. I wasn't going to get sucked in and feel bad that they had feelings. And again, often later, mm -hmm. I would realize, oh my gosh, of course my child seemed to overreact to that little limit because <laughs> all this is going on in their life. You know, I'm expecting a new baby and they're this or that. You know, there's always reasons why children do these things. It's often just emotionally driven. Yeah, they need to express that emotion. And I think part of where you're going now leads to another suit <laughs> that you use, and that's clarity, that children deserve clarity. And that really ties in with conviction, doesn't yes. it? Yes, it does. So clarity, it could be even saying, you know, if something's inconsistent, but it's clarity of saying, yeah, I said that, but I changed my mind and this is what I'm doing. I worked with this beautiful parent and we did an online consultation and her toddler was there and she was trying to take something away from her that she realized that she was letting her play with, but she didn't want her to completely unravel it. It was it was like dental floss or something. For some reason, she was letting her play with this stuff while she's talking to me. And, but it wasn't really a yes thing. It was a maybe. And she went to take it away from her. And she was in this like gentle tug of war with her daughter because she wasn't sure. She wasn't clear. And that just leaves the child stuck in the zone of, mm. you know, discomfort where instead of saying, ah, I got to take this away, you know, and doing it clearly and firmly, but with love, instead of like, uh, I'm not sure of myself. And so I'm going to give you this really unclear message. Well, and that leads to the last C. And actually, of course, you have so many more like calm and caring, but the last that we'll have time for today, and that is confidence. And I think that just comes with practice. I agree. Time. I agree. Yeah, it does take practice. I always feel like if I could do this, anyone could do it. No one would ever have described me as a confident person. But uh -huh. my children have given me this. I've seen how it works. I've seen how it's the most loving thing to do. It's the most brave thing to do. It's heroic. So this is what I try to give parents as well. I want to give them what I got. So for that, I thank Magda Gerber and it almost makes me cry thinking of huh. how grateful I am to her for mm. <laughs> changing my life and giving me my life. Uh, wow. I, I love the vulnerability that you shared and you're just sharing right now. Regardless of the degrees that we have behind us, loving and caring and raising a child and children requires a superhero effort. And we do it because the love is so great. Yes. And I, and I thank you so much for what you do through your books and your counseling. Your passion for this is so evident and your millions, literally, of followers are testimony to your dedication. Thank you. Janet, as we start to wrap up this interview, I'm wondering, is there a last piece of advice you want to give about stepping into that superhero role? Be good to yourselves. Be easy on yourself. Know that hmm. this is a huge journey especially if we're changing generational cycles. It is often one step forward, two steps back. <laughs> and that's okay. So please give yourself grace. It's not that easy to do serious damage, especially if you're already listening, if you're already on these paths of trying to be the best parent you can be. You've got this. Be mm. nice to yourself. <laughs> You end your podcast with saying, we can do this. We can. <laughs> and I love that message. We can. We really can. Day by day. Day by day. And I'm still learning. I'm still learning. Hmm. Janet, I thank you so much for this conversation. It's such a privilege and a joy to talk with you. And I'd love to pick your brain again. Oh, I would love that too. Thank you. This was really fun. Thank you. Whew. Wow.
Rachel, you and I were so intrigued by the list of questions that Janet included, the questions the child is naturally seeking answers for when, they, when they're testing boundaries. Well, yeah. I'll list the questions. Okay. Am I safe and cared for? Do I have confident leaders? Right. Are they with me or against me? Is it okay to want what I want, mm. to feel what I feel? Mm. These are actually questions behind the unsettledness in so many of us because of this past year. 2020. Yeah. <laughs> with the pandemic, yeah. but also with the environmental tragedies. Well, and, and societal unrests on so many fronts. Exactly. And as Janet described, these are healthy and natural questions to ask ourselves when the world around us feels so uncertain. Yeah. And, and recognizing the need behind these questions mm. that Janet lists, it's part of how we nurture respectful interactions with each other yeah. in our families and communities. Respectful interactions. Such a great goal yeah. for 2021. Yeah. And Janet's words offer a great starting place for that. They do. So thank you, Janet. Yeah. If you like what you're hearing, please subscribe. Rate the show, leave a comment, and tell a friend. Each Family 360 episode ends with music inspired by the words of our guest. You heard bits and pieces of this music during this interview. Here's the song, Unruffled. And you can find it in our resource section for every episode or wherever you stream music.
Rachel Cram. I'm Roy Salmon, and thank you so much for listening to Family 360. We share quotes and links from all our guests on Family 360 on our website, Facebook, and Instagram. Join us. We'd love to continue the conversation with you.